Um, <laughs> my name is Susan Crumdike, and I am an associate professor in mechanical engineering at Canterbury University. Um, you're right, not many women do that. <laughs> but that's okay, change, you know? Sort of a maturity of the way that we understand things to be and expect that they might become. You know, it's still not a real big expectation that we're going to have a lot of women mechanical engineers, let alone professors. We, this last year, were at 7% women in our incoming class again, so it's not, not something that's changing a lot, but a few free radicals can, can really start something new, so that's what I count myself as. Um, I was asked to come and talk to you all, and I can't remember if this was suggested or if I said, well, this is kind of interesting, people might like to hear about this, but the, the other talks so far, hopefully this will be a good fit. This is work that I've done and um, some of my students and postdocs, and we work pretty hard, really. We work a lot. <laughs> and I could spend my time just doing the one job that, that, I, that I do pretty well. I work on high temperature materials by chemical vapor deposition. I can make very thin layers, nano thin layers of ceramic materials on other things and they can form very well. And I write lots of papers about that and you know, <clears throat> go to conferences and have patents and that sort of thing. And I could just do that and have a good career, you know, the, the, like, the thing that you do. <laughs> and nothing would change. Right. And for myself, I had to actually go into that field of advanced materials because at the time that I was trying to do my PhD in the um, late 1990s, I couldn't find a supervisor and I couldn't find funding and I couldn't find a project in energy, which was my field before that. You know, that I did my master's and my undergrad in systems engineering and, and um, mechanical engineering with energy systems. And, you know, I thought, it's not that long till we really kind of hit the wall and nobody's doing energy research except for, and actually the advanced materials, it was for fuel cells. That's what I was working on was fuel cells. My first PhD project was actually in combustion and biomass. <clears throat> so it's just, it's a very interesting thing how far away the future seems when you don't really want to think about it very much. And especially when you don't have standard ways to deal with what is coming, when there's, there's no sort of textbook that explains the processes and the methods that we need to, to, to undertake. But that's what people like me are supposed to do. There, it looks like we're starting to get people in. <laughs> I thought the sound of somebody talking would, would round them up. <laughs> That's why I'm not blazing through my slides. <laughs> I've given it a few minutes. Um, people like me who, oh, there's an official person. Did you want to introduce me? I just picked up the microphone and went with it. I may as well. I did this because actually I went out there to try and get there to come and hear the crowd and follow them like the five five. But it's probably just when you started to go on a little bit later anyway. Um, and as you can tell, you know, she's... Susan's awesome. She's very down to earth. And some of the work that she's been doing is, is fantastic. So, um, I just want to announce that at um, maybe 25 past 12, we will do the notices then instead of at the beginning. Thanks. We're going to do the what? Notices. Notices. Oh, okay. I've got a whole <laughs> All right, so it looks like we're about ready to get going. Um, where was I? I can't actually ramble all day. I mean, that's, that's not a problem. <laughs> Just sort of killing a little bit of time. Oh, yeah, so how did I get here? Clearly, I'm not a New Zealander. Um, as I tell people, because I think this is kind of a funny quip, that I haven't yet had that elective surgery to, to sort of snap my tongue down so that I can speak like a Kiwi. <laughs> right, never mind. Okay, so it's a little funny. <laughs> well, I've been here since 2000 down at Canterbury University, and in that time, why did I come to New Zealand? Um, because the work that I wanted to do in the United States, I knew was not going to fly. But here, they couldn't fire me if I did it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have graduated 12 PhD students, and um, two of them have been in the advanced materials field, and the rest of them have been in what I'm now calling transition engineering. Um, 
that's the work of change. There is already a field of transition engineering. It's the engineers who do a lot of the IT and computer stuff because that stuff is change. It's always change. You've probably noticed that. <laughs> Just about the time you get good at whatever it is they've given you the last time, it's like, <laughs> you moved it again. I can't figure out how to... <laughs> so, so that whole field of engineering, of figuring out how to change things, and I don't know if you've noticed, but they're changing things for the smaller and the more efficient. And why not? So if we could do that in other fields, then things might get better. And it's that work of very complex systems and in the inclusivity of it, understanding the dynamics of whole systems and how they behave, how they have been behaving, how the mind accepts or rejects new things, just a whole lot of stuff. So it's very fun engineering. And I'm gonna tell you about a project that is now the culmination of those um, 10 years of work and a lot of student work. And we had this idea that what we would really like to do is develop the stuff that will one day be the transitioning, uh, <laughs> transition engineering um, textbook that we'll be teaching to people. The same way that we now have safety engineering, where whatever it is you're doing in whatever field, you have to think about the damage that you could do and how to not do it. So if we could do that same sort of thing where in every field there's transition engineers who are specialists and yet everybody has to be working on that project as well, be, be included in it and thinking about it, then that would be the way to go. And so we've put together a whole bunch of new kinds of things to do and the city of Dunedin rang me up and said we want you to do a peak oil vulnerability project for us. <clears throat> and I had a small idea of probably what it was they were thinking what they wanted, and they didn't get that. That was the first chapter out of six. <laughs> right? What is peak oil? How do we convince the rest of the business, industry, population, um, counselors that this is an issue? That's sort of what they thought they needed. And why did they think they needed that? Well, I think it has something to do with some noisy people in Dunedin. <laughs> There's anybody here from Dunedin? One. All right. Well, it is a long ways. <laughs> yes. And I think they have some people down there who have sort of been pushing, you know, that council, we want you to think about these things, the, the peak oil and the, and the climate change. It seems like stuff you ought to be thinking about. And they've had probably one of the first sustainability um, charters in their, in their plan, these sort of things. So they've, they've been moving along, and sometimes it seems reluctantly, but there's been a push there. And it's from the ground up. It's not been led by the mayor. It's not been championed by the council. It has been a push from the ground up. And I sort of got this sense when the CEO of the council talked to me about it, about this project, that it was just like, we just got to get these people off our back. <laughs> right? They said they wanted this peak oil study, um, you know, so that everybody could be scared and then we can get on with what we need to do. <laughs> so I talked to him and I said, well, look, we actually can do something useful here. Believe me, it'll be good. You'll be glad you did this. And so I think that's what we got. And I thought, I'll tell you about it and I'll let you know that other cities are now lined up and I have a report that I need to deliver this afternoon if somebody of the IT guys can help me get connected to the internet, that would be good. But <clears throat> it's like any product, once you show how it works, once you understand what you got for it, then, then, then it becomes something that you can do. So I hope you, you enjoy this. Um, and I definitely want to let you know it's not me. Yes, I'm the leader of a group. We call ourselves the Advanced Energy and Material Systems Lab. And this is, this is the lab from a year ago, just before um, the last big earthquake, and just before I left for sabbatical last year. And um, we've, we've got just so much energy. These people come from all over the world to do what, again, they can't find a way to do wherever they are. If you Google sustainability, you'll get lots of things. If you Google sustainability together with mechanical engineering, you get us. You know, that's, hopefully that will change and there will be a lot more, but, but those two things really should go together because everything that isn't sustainable is sort of on our back. 
So we do need to get our act together and figure out how to change everything that we've put together that, that really is quite useful, but maybe not all inclusive in thought and effect. All right, so I just put down the, the areas that, I've, um, that the students that I've um, supervised have come from. And I think we've got a, a little global perspective here. You know, all the way from a, a small village in Ghana um, to the giant cities of Brazil, there's, there's a lot of world out there. And to be able to understand all these different perspectives and always take from everybody that I meet, sort of a, a thing I like to do, always take from everybody I meet something that I've learned. You know, that's, that's the way to work. And we formed a company, actually, to, to do this work, East Research. That's Energy Activity System Transition. <laughs> if you've got an energy activity system, we'll help you transition it. <laughs> and we presented this to um, the city of Dunedin, and the people who worked the most on it were Stacy Rindle, Montero Wachara, Sukarn, and Shannon Page, who's now at Lincoln. All right, the thing that is the big question, peak oil, right? Um, an issue is something that can disrupt your normal activities. It can threaten your prosperity. It can mean that you have to stop what you're doing and do something else. So that's an issue. So is peak oil an issue or is it something that the market will simply take care of? Is it something that maybe we shouldn't really think about it because it doesn't seem to be coming from legitimate sources? You know, peak oil as an issue. Well, even if you thought it was an issue, what would you do about it? And I think it's that gap which leads us, especially at the leadership level, our leaders, to not be working on it, to not be thinking about it, to not be addressing it. Because there's such a big gap between if you even thought it was a problem, if you acknowledged it, you don't have a plan. There isn't a way to go. And so we have to stay back from where it is a problem and just carry on which has gotten us very close to the front edge of the problem without any plan, but that's all right, we're, we're moving on. And even if you wanted to do something about it, how would you do it? Who would you call? All right? Ghostbusters, <laughs> yeah, that might help. <laughs> call an oil company, I don't, you know, this is a big problem. So the problem is the problem itself, but then this gap. And the gap comes between ourselves and what our past experience is and what we know rationally is going to happen tomorrow. I know the plane is probably going to fly me back to Christchurch on Tuesday. I know my car has petrol in it. You know what I mean? There's this continuity that when, when we start to think about oil running out, it just doesn't fit with what we know because it isn't going to happen tomorrow. And when we think about the collapse of the world as we know it, just like, yeah, but I have tickets to Rarotonga in six months, right? <laughs> so I hope the collapse is after that. <laughs> so this discontinuity between facts that we know are an issue and what it means we're going to do about it. Um, and I think that this takes us to engineering projects. You, you can have really big gaps between where you are and where you want to go. And a bridge is a good symbol of that and also a good functional um, explanation of that. That when is it not a good idea to, get, to be able to get across rivers? I mean, well, okay, I did find one example. Um, we went up to um, this mountain that's over here. I was wondering why it still has bush on it. You know, this one here, because in New Zealand we're pretty good at chopping that stuff down. <laughs> and there's, you can see it over here, right? There's a, there's a forest park. And, and I, I was just scratching my head. Why, why is that still there? And then we got to that gorge. I'm like, I see why it's still there. That's quite a barrier. There's a gorge out there that is, I don't know how deep it is, but it's like impossible. And, and so the mountain still has bush on it. So being able to get across a river, you connect trade, you know? So it's not that hard of an idea to think it would be good to have a bridge. But do you know what it actually takes to get a bridge? It's a lot of work. There's materials, there's costs. Somebody has to come up with the money, and they have to know how they're going to get that money back, how they're going to get their investment paid back. You have to figure out how you're going to pay for it. You have to figure out 
um, what the foundation should be like. You have to understand what the floods that come through there might be like. You have to maybe do a little seismic engineering. What's going to go across it? These three bridges are, it, are all in, on the same river. The, the footbridge on the left is only for pedestrians. And the other picture of a highway bridge and a rail bridge are taken from that bridge. So there's three bridges in a row, and this is Taiwan. <clears throat> and so it is a very good idea for people to go back and forth, apparently, because you can also see the little ferry boats down there that go back and forth. But the work involved in making these bridges, they're for different things, and they're engineered totally differently. They take different loads. They have different um, dynamics. It actually takes engineering. How, do we have any engineers here? One, two, three, four, five. All right, so you guys know that the rest of the world doesn't understand, right? It's just... <laughs> or care. <laughs> or care, right? You give them everything, and they think it just came out of thin air. If I have a dollar, I can get anything, right? Okay, sort of. <laughs> right, so why engineered infrastructure? I know it seems like it's the engineered infrastructure that's the problem, right? If we hadn't built all those roads, if we hadn't built all those freeways, everything would have been better. <laughs> but I just thought I'd throw this in because um, this is again in Taiwan. And yeah, I'm amused. I'm amused a lot. And I'm amused because of what I'm looking at across the, the river here. If we look a little closer, we see an apartment building. And we see kind of a lot of uh, pipes running around. <laughs> this is distributed generation in action. <laughs> Indoor plumbing is really useful, right? And who doesn't want it? But if you don't have engineered infrastructure, well, I, I guess it works. I mean, everybody goes and gets their own pump, and they put their own what, pipe in the river, and they run their, <laughs> their pipe up to their apartment. <laughs> and some of them, there's, there's hundreds of them a little ways up. They're strung across the river, and they go up the hill. It's, it's quite ingenious. Um, but the engineering of it is quite diabolical. These things aren't, aren't properly done. Their electrocution hazards is just, yeah. So people will get stuff done one way or another, right? They'll do what they want to, they know it's useful. They'll go for it. <laughs> but maybe a little bit of cooperation <laughs> and a little bit of standards and a little bit of good engineering um, it doesn't hurt too much. So again, let's talk about transition engineering. And now this is going to be all vocabulary-ish, and I'm sorry about that. But <clears throat> it will illustrate a point that everybody, each group of people who have their own way of doing things, their own thing, they invent their own language around it. And to a certain degree, their own uniform. I'm not in your uniform, am I? I'm in my professor's uniform. OK, kind of a scaled down version. I don't have the jacket on. But, um, or the shiny shoes. I wore the dull shoes just to be part of you guys today. <laughs> so we have a uniform. We have a language that we speak that differentiates us from other people. If you don't believe me, talk to a policeman, talk to a doctor, talk to a lawyer. My daughter, I was helping her print out some things. She's studying for her exams to be a lawyer. And I was reading it, and I was going, I hope that makes sense to you. I don't even know what this is saying. You know, but that's the way it is. Ha! Huh. You know what the future needs? We actually have to, it, we have to put that back together and figure out how we're going to talk to each other. And that's where I, I know the permaculture. You, you have your own language, the 12 principles and that sort of thing. You got the things that you talk about and the way you talk about. And I don't actually know what compost tea is. Should I be keeping those tea bags? And <laughs> right. <laughs> but you've got to understand that um, that your cities, while they grow organically, there is a lot of management and planning that goes into that. And how oil supply factors into that, that sort of thinking in that language is what your city planners need to move on. And people understand, people in planning positions understand risk assessment. If they have assets, like a convention center, public assets that have been built with your money through your rates, those are called assets. And they have to understand, um, you know, those assets are meant to bring in revenue to the city, right? They're meant to provide well-being and to bring in revenue and to pay for themselves over time as people use them. And so how does peak oil affect those assets um, and the activities that people want to do? And 
if it's going to have an effect, which we said an issue is something that stops you from doing what you were gonna do, that threatens your prosperity or your fr um, fruitfulness, then you have to change. You can't do anything about the oil. You have to change. And change means adaptation. You know the definition of adaptation? When there are change, the process of changing or the change itself to survive when conditions change. That's what we're gonna have to do. That's the whole project is adaptation and change. But it has to have, uh, we have to understand the whole rollout process too. What is the time frame in which these things um, need to adapt? And then the thing that we do, strategic transition analysis, strategic why. Because um, when, when I plant a seed in a pot, a plant is pretty much known not to be strategic. Its strategy for adaptation is already built into its DNA, but an individual plant isn't strategic. It grows according to its internal plan that it's already got until it hits the edge of the pot. A strategic approach to filling your pot might be to look ahead and go, well, you know, it's sort of a waste of energy to grow a lot of leaves and have to drop them when we, when we get root bound. So maybe we'll just sort of slow down growth as we approach the edge of the pot and then put up some sort of signal to somebody to bring us some new nutrients or something. <laughs> you know? So you sort of look ahead to where you're gonna hit limits and change your behavior as you get near those limits. That's, that's what strate um, a strategic approach is. And that's what we're gonna work on. So the very first part of the whole project is communication of the issue to everyone in the community, right? So to the people who will tell us that the peak of oil supply means the end of civilization, we have to communicate to them that that might not actually be the case, right? That it means a beginning of changes in a way that we weren't thinking were going to be on the whole, but it probably does not mean the lights go out, which we now pretty much have evidence for because the conventional oil supply has peaked. And there was a big economic ramification and lots of changes, but the way things change, we really have to be analytical about that. So the, the issue of peak oil being, um, you know, being able to explain what it actually means when it's really clear what it means and yet it's really confusing because there's a lot of ways to look at it and there's a lot of uncertainty in any given way you look at it. And when we have a lot of uncertainty, then we have a lot of good reasons not to pay attention. Right? That works with climate change too. Well, the scientists can't even agree whether two degrees is okay or three or whatever. So go on. I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> right, so this is something we came up with. Probability. If we're going to talk about issues and risks, then we have to talk about the probability in a given time frame of that issue occurring. So this is a, what's called a meta-analysis, which means you look at all of the geological data and all of the analysis about the rate of use, the reserves that are left, and what's happening over time, and you don't pick one, you use them all. It's like you have a big room full of experts and you have them all explain to you what, you think, what they think is going on and you say, well, you're all right given what you're doing, so let's look at all of you together. And that's what this plot is. And um, the way we do it is called a Raleigh distribution with the Monte Carlo simulation of taking all that information and turning it into a probability space, right? So this red line at the bottom is the future oil supply that 97% of all the experts agree we will probably have. So that's your low risk tolerance position. If you want to plan for a future where you are using an amount of oil which will probably be available, you, you look at this end. And if you want to say, well, I'm willing to take a huge risk that none, not even the US Geological Survey, none of the experts really think we're gonna have more than that amount of oil up here in this, this time frame, 2030, 2040, 2050, then you, you'd be crazy to be looking up here. And what you see then is if you're willing to accept that argument that probably if we listen to all the experts out there, that that's the way to manage our risk position, then you can see for yourself what that means. This we actually did in 2005 and we've been right so far. That's the area that oil supply has been in, that green area. Um, the, high percentage area. And if you wanna do long-term planning, even at a 50-50 probability, which isn't all that good, half, half of the experts think there'll be a bit more oil, half of them think there'll be less, then this is what we're looking at. 
by the year 2050, so 40 years in the future, a 50% reduction in the amount of fuel you use. All right, in 2010, talking to the city of Dunedin, this is really hard to get your head around. Using less oil at all is nearly impossible to think about. I mean, for you guys, I know it isn't. But you know that 90% of the people out there, they would just not be able to get their heads around that. How would we use less oil? We were planning on using more. <laughs> right? In 2008, the IEA said we were going to have 250% more you know, by this time. What the heck? <laughs> so the very idea of using less, the trick here, how did I get the City Council of Dunedin and the businesses of Dunedin to accept this premise that we are going to now embark on a planning and modeling and analysis exercise by which we are going to look at what steps to take to reduce our oil demand by 50% by 2050. How did I get them to do that? because I let them choose their risk, their risk position. You tell me, what risk position do you want to take? The one I'm doing for Palmerston North right now, they chose 85%. Dunedin, well, we don't know. So we'll go with 50-50. If you let someone else take control in any way, don't just be bombarding them with stuff. Let them take some control. They get some choice. You tell me, what's your risk position? Okay then, this is what we, that, that's what we plan for then. That's a huge turnaround. If you want to use this, it's a published journal paper. It's a published New Zealand Transport Authority um, uh, research paper or research. It's not a paper; it's real thick. Um, there's a lot of other journal papers based on this. Um, it's pretty useful. Do you understand that difference between you just telling somebody there's a problem with peak oil? There's a problem with peak oil. Well, you tell me, what risk are you willing to take? And let's see what all of the experts in ge petroleum geology have to say about that. And let's, you know, if you want to agree with all of them, then let's go. So that was the very first big trick. So now that we're ready to talk about planning, 10, 20, 30, 40 years in the future, what are we going to work on? This is New Zealand um, fuel use, transport energy use, in 2009. and. Um, um, aviation's pretty big, actually. It is pretty big in this country. Um, here's all of our production. Mining, recreation, forestry, agriculture, that's our tourists. Behind the gate, on road. Um, where's our fishing? It's too small to see, really. It's <laughs> so the things that we do that actually, that's how we make a living, is the purple one. And then... Um, Rail, you can see, is a pretty small slice, so I'm sure National is justified in getting rid of it. <laughs> That's the rationale, right? Okay. And this one, this is what we're going to work on. What I'm thinking is that, here's the position, that if there's going to be a 50% reduction in the amount of fuel in the system, that there will be an allocation that we will not have a 50% reduction over all sectors, that the sectors that actually produce what we need will use oil, and us driving down to the video store, maybe not. All right? This is very elective, or we don't actually know what it is, actually, because nobody's studied it too much. So this is where we're going to go now. We're going to go to what's called personal transport. You and me moving ourselves around in cars, and we're going to have to think about that changing over time. This little cartoon I made, say, look, change happens. We are beings of change. It isn't the change that we're afraid of, it's a change we don't understand that we're afraid of. All we have ever done is change. When we didn't change, we were called Neanderthals, and look what happened to them. So, <laughs> change is us, we're okay with that. But what we have to do is have some way to understand what is a good investment right now, and what's a dud. Because if I invest in something that's fruitful throughout that change, that's a good idea. That was a good use of our, of our remaining assets. And what I do know is that all of that involves less energy. So anything that gets me um, growth, growth, that's true, growth, 
Everything has growth, even a poor spindly little tree up in a really windy place that's pretty hard to live in. There's growth and there's decay. And it's knowing which leaves to put out that, that, that will actually get us a little bit of food, right? Why do you think they always just sort of grow into the sun, right? So even though there will always be less of this good thing that we like so much, oil, the key to flourishing when there's less is to not need so much, right? <laughs> if there isn't much to work with, then the key is to work fine without needing much. Right? That's a, one of your principles, isn't it? Is it? Something like that. <laughs> a rewriting of a principle. Now, here's the trick with it, though. It means adaptation. And again, in a way that we don't understand all that well. So what we have to understand, what the engineering work I have to do, is to find out how we depend on fuel and how that change um, can occur. And we call that adaptive capacity. What is the ability to change? What does it cost? Do we actually save money? Is there something else good that would happen if we changed in that way anyway? So looking at our current energy use, how it changes at least as fast as the oil supply changes to a future travel demand and understanding this little problem. Can you all see that picture? <laughs> it's the famous monkey trap. <laughs> all right. Understanding that we're all in a monkey trap, that there's something that we know is our favorite thing. We, we know it works really well. And yet, there's a danger coming if we don't let go of it. So I got to figure out two things. I got to figure out how to get you to let go of the thing that you do understand, that you do really like. <laughs> and then how to figure out that you, know, that, that you need to do that and that it would be better if you did. So it's a little bit of a trick of an engineering problem, but that's all right. And um, this is just a, a bit of understanding that the way we use energy is not just because we're bad people, right? You've heard that, right? Well, if people were just not, t -t -t right? Bad behavior, all of you. You drove a car. <laughs> bad, bad. Oh, well, somebody made a very nice road, a very easy to drive vehicle, plenty of fuel to put in it, at a price I can afford. I would actually be irrational. Where are those bike riders? That's bloody irrational to ride your bike here for a long time. <laughs> They're the nuts. <laughs> the rest of us are doing the obvious thing, right? So, so that all comes about. Um, understanding the spatial relationships between things. Where are things? The distances between things is really where, where it's at. Once that's set, then on top of that you can put, well, okay, what networks do people have to actually move between those things? Where are they? Where are the things they need to get to? And how are those connected? Um, if they're only connected by freeway, don't get on your bike and ride on the freeway. That's not a good idea. Right? Um, and then the urban form that grows around those things. Or sometimes it's backwards. There actually was an urban form and then somebody plowed a freeway through it. So these two things go together. And then by the time you're in that setting, you can make behavior choices. So don't put it all on people's behavior. You have to go all the way down and look at your land use planning, your net, net, uh, transportation networks, the way your urban form is laid out, how walkable it is, how accessible it is, how polluted it is, how dangerous it is, how pleasant it is, how treated it is, right? There's an awful lot of stuff you have to look at before you can say people should change their behavior. Right? And that's all the engineering stuff. So that's the stuff we're going to look at. And then once you have that behavior component, that then determines how much energy is used. So here's what we did for Dunedin. <clears throat> First thing is those destinations. What's the land use pattern? This is where the people live in Dunedin. Dunedin City Council actually, okay, everybody knows Dunedin's a city in the South Island, right? <laughs> 160,000 people more or less. And Dunedin City Council actually is this huge land area. There's a little city that's pretty compact right here. University, um, uh, medical center, regional medical center. There's industrial stuff. There's a port. There's a, um, there's a rail station, CBD. So it's a nice little city, but it actually includes a lot of people spread out all around. Um, and that's um, GIS data, it's called. Um, now, with that data, we mine through um, Ministry of Transport 
Warna Fitness data, and why nobody's ever thought to do this before, I don't know. But it was a pretty good idea, got a student to spend a lot of time in front of a computer, and we can now mine that database to find out how much you drive. <laughs> and connect it to your household. And so these are the people, these are the uh, burbs of Dunedin, and here's how much they drive. So it's a huge sample. Um, this database has 40 million data points in it. So it's a pretty good sample. The people right in the middle of, of town, central Dunedin, they drive in the 10,000 K a year range. And the people in the lifestyle areas, out on the beach, the people who like to, mostly what, the people from, from the UK? <laughs> That's what we found anyway. I mean, you know, you come from a place where living by the ocean is like the thing you could never do, right? You would, you would aspire to that. And then you come to Dunedin, and geez, you can go get a house out on the beach. You're there. And then the rural people, it comes back down again. So just kind of interesting. But what this gives us is the travel demand pattern as a function of where people are living in this city. And the next thing that's really important is your income segregation. All right, if we were looking at a map of Phoenix in the United States or Detroit, we would see that the people of low means, the people without a lot of money, are segregated in certain places. And the very affluent people, or we'd even see this in Sydney, the affluent people are segregated into other places. And transportation-wise, this is a huge energy footprint. Because, I'm guessing, not all of the jobs for low-income people are in the low-income area. They're having to try to move out of that area into the rest of the city. And in general, if they don't have public transport to do that, they're having what's called transport poverty, that they're actually poor because of transport because they can't get to jobs. And that's a very big problem in a lot of the world. And what we see for Dunedin, what this is, um, high vulnerability means you have a low household income. You have, in the New Zealand uh, household survey, you said you had to drive to work. You drove your car to work. And you have a mortgage. So you, your ability to pay more for fuel isn't that great, and yet you have to drive to work. So that puts you in the high vulnerability. If you have plenty of money, um, or if, if you don't have a lot of money and you said, no, I don't have to drive to work, I, I, I rode my bike to work yesterday, then you would have probably a low vulnerability because you're not exposed to the um, risk of high fuel price. So if we look at Dunedin, what we see is that we don't have a lot of segregation. These are as small a, a units as you can get, the household census units. Um, and that mixture, the fact that people of different incomes can live anywhere in the city, they can choose what their distance that they travel is because they have the ability to choose where in that city they're going to live. That's huge. City of Dunedin, don't lose this. This is like getting a, a test because you thought maybe you had cancer and you find out you don't. Okay, this is really good news, that the city of Dunedin does not have income segregation. It has the ability for people to live anywhere in the city. Um, so that's a, a good tool, good diagnostic tool. The next one that we came up with was the PhD work of Montero Wacharasukan, and it's a type of self-energy audit of your transportation travel demand. And you can go online and do this um, program if you want, and it will calculate your risk exposure to high fuel price and it will calculate um, how far you go. And if you can use Google Map, you can do it. It's hooked into Google Map, so you put, there's my house, and there's where I went, and I went on Monday. So you fill it out like a diary. So we did this survey for Dunedin, and um, here's some people doing the survey. And what the idea here is that the, the way it works is you put in your, your normal week. Okay, on Monday I go from home to work at 9, and then I come home at 5, and I pick up the kids on the way. So you just put in your life. And then for each one of those trips, if, you, if it was a car trip, we ask you, do you have another way? If you couldn't use your car, do you have another way to make that trip? And your options are, no, I don't. Or, yeah, I could bike. Yeah, I could, take a, I could get a ride with somebody. Yeah, I could ride the bus. <clears throat> yeah, I could walk. Yeah, I could just do it without traveling. If you tell us you could do those other things, and you got up to three choices, then what we think is that you have adaptive capacity. If you say, no, then something bad would happen if you couldn't use your car. And what we found was that people substituted in that their own idea of why they might not have a car, and it didn't have anything to do with peak oil. We actually tried this survey a couple years before that, which is why we had to invent this survey. 
and we asked people, what would you do if the price of fuel went up? This was in 2005. They said, well, that's so far, I mean, what? That wouldn't happen. Nobody answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's terrible to have a student who's, you know, this is their, this is their project, and they, they get, you know, they go to all this work, write up the survey, ask 60 people, what would you do if the price of fuel doubled? Well, that can't happen. Well, by then, my, my income would be doubled, so it wouldn't matter. Well, that couldn't happen. It did! Three years later! <laughs> it was a good question. <laughs> So I had to find a different way to find out your adaptive capacity. And we don't know exactly what pressure it is that pushes you, but what we think we know is that whatever you tell us, yeah, I have another way. That's, that's true, and it is the maximum adaptive capacity. So for, um, you've got price elasticity, which we're not all that elastic with price, but what people were substituting was, oh, well, like when the battery went flat, right? When I couldn't use my car. Do I have another way to do that? And we didn't have anyone panic and fall out of their chair. 580 participants, so <laughs> that was good. So here's Dunedin's results. The number of trips in a week that people who normally drive a car, this is 100% of the car trips in our survey, the number of trips per week that people could have another way was 60%. Would you have guessed it's that high? Right, because people won't get out of their car, will they? No. People don't want to get out of their car. Behavior, behavior, behavior. <laughs> Truth is, in Dunedin, they can. This is funny, though. They have a bus service, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, real, um, a real popular thing. And we did have one guy told us, no, I'd rather walk an hour than ride the bus. <laughs> Not quite sure what's going on in Dunedin, but that, you know, they could improve their bus service, apparently. If we add up the kilometers, it's not quite as much as 50% of the kilometers traveled in Dunedin right now in a week could be done in a way that doesn't use fuel. And the number of liters per week, um, about 40% could be done another way. Now you see on that one, the other way is bus. Um, so buses are also subject to peak oil, so we're gonna have to talk about that in a minute. This is an analysis which is now being used um, um, for, for uh, other cities, and it's been published in a very prestigious journal. What we're doing here is every green dot is a house. So again, we use that data about where people live. So every green dot is a house, Every blue dot is a destination, and in this case, a primary school. And if, okay, the, the computer program goes along the transport network, so paths, roads, whatever, goes along the transport network between origins and destinations, and if that distance, in this case, is walkable by a primary school child, then the house gets a green dot. If it is only accessible cycling, by a primary school child, so that's like a kilometer and a half, and this one's about 700 meters, um, then it gets that, and if it's outside that range, it gets a red dot. So looking at the city of Dunedin, the children in that town can get to their schools by walking. I wouldn't close any of those schools, actually. So there's a decision about assets that in the light of the future of needing to use less fuel, you get an answer that it makes sense to actually have all these schools there, which is probably why they were there in the first place, because people did walk to school, right? It makes some kind of sense. So there, first asset decision, don't shut down any more of the primary schools. Um, how about food, supermarket access? Right now, the supermarkets are where other kind of markets used to be, but here they are in Dunedin. These blue dots are places you can get food, and the, um, this is grown-ups in Dunedin most of them can access a supermarket without a car. That's interesting information. I think that mechanical engineers could contribute to how people move loads around by foot. <laughs> There's a lot of very clever engineering that could be done, right? Hand trucks, hand trolleys, wheelbarrow, that would hurt your shoulders. We can do better than that. Better, 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 come on. <laughs> Yeah, bike trailers, that's pretty handy. <laughs> Servant, I like that one. <laughs> oh, what's happening? Deny, deny. Whoops, okay, there we go. Oh, allow is better? Okay. <laughs> we'll be inclusive of whatever that was, okay. Uh-oh. Always allow. Always allow. 
<laughs> all right, thank you. All right, so here's our, our, those are all the tests we did on Dunedin to see what their position is, you know. What is the size of the issue for you with peak oil, Dunedin? And um, so think of it as a health test, right? So you do all these tests. And Dunedin is not all bad news, but fruitful adaptation will require transition engineering. So we are going to look at what we could do with the urban form, with technology, and with behavior. The current urban form, people drive 95% of the time. All 95% of all trips are by car. <laughs> Okay, that's sounding a bit like behavior, since we said they could take another way. <laughs> um, but what if there were more housing in the urban center? Where people said they were going, the biggest number of trips is shopping. That's the biggest percentage. When people get in the car to go, it's shopping. So what if there were, say, 20% um, more people lived in, right in the central city, where our, our least traveling people were, then what would happen? And that would save, we can actually calculate how much fuel that would save. Um, what would it be like to have more people living in the center of Dunedin? Would it be a horrible thing? We know Kiwis don't like density, right? We don't, we don't like to live on top of each other. But there, we're not talking about everybody. Could we find 20% of the people who now live, you know, out somewhere else where they're having to travel a lot, if we gave them a nice place to live in an urban area where they had all the amenities and they could walk out their door and get everything they need, that actually is an appealing lifestyle to a lot of people. So it might not be the worst thing ever. And it would be real estate development. And it would be recovery of a lot of old historic buildings which are now decrepit and empty in that city. So redevelopment of your downtown, it is a type of growth. It's a kind of economic growth. It's a kind of giving people a job, giving people a nice place to work. It spurs economic growth around it. We also said you'd have to close down some of those horrible streets with all the traffic on them. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth going there. <laughs> all right, um, integrated urban villages. Now, this is one that when we looked back in the history of Dunedin, we actually found them there in the first place. OK, well, the always allow wasn't the ultimate solution. <laughs> All right, so we looked at those um, where there's now sort of these shopping areas and they're getting a bit decrepit and we said, okay, we calculated that, that if you revitalize those little things into little villages that you could reduce the car demand, again, because of shopping. So what would that look like? We'd be talking about some sort of a thing that the experience of it at ground level is a village, a real one not just a strip mall or something. It's um, because what we want to do is on the weekends, we want to have open access markets. We can actually use models of if you give people access to markets, which means a place they can meet the customer at a low cost with the right kind of regulation around it that doesn't try to stifle it, but that lets it flourish, you can grow local businesses. And the local business in Dunedin is, is pretty, pretty gone. It used to be there pretty flourishing, and now it's pretty much gone. So we grow local businesses. Um, the next one was 100 kilometers of bikeways, so safe bikeways. All those kids who could get to their schools, they are going to be able to get to their schools without ever having to fight with a car. All right, my alternative to this, what well, wouldn't even be an alternative, but the other thing, if anybody wants to champion a policy, a crumb dike policy, $10,000 fine, you touch a human with your car. <laughs> Automatic fine. The problem is not bikers hitting cars. I'm pretty sure. The problem is not pedestrian damage to vehicles. <laughs> the problem is vehicles not seeing. I didn't even see them. Well, look! <laughs> if you had an automatic $10,000 fine, if your car touched a human being, <sighs> you'd start looking for them, wouldn't you? <laughs> Oh, but people will throw themselves in front of cars then to get $10,000. Right. <laughs> Somehow, I think not. <laughs> All right, and by the way, that wasn't original from me. They do that in Taiwan. <laughs> if, you, if you hit one of those scooters, if you hit a pedestrian, a scooter, or a biker with a car, it's much bigger than $10,000, and they have very, very few accidents. It's amazing what looking for people will do. All right, the other one is this one, electric trolley buses. Not necessarily the rail ones, but an electric overhead bus um, is immune to peak oil. And if you look at where you could lay those out, if I go 
um, okay, if I want a development, like, like a retail development, a cafe, I need three reasons why people come past my door to have a flourishing business. Three reasons. One might be that they came to my shop, but that wouldn't be the best one. The best one would be they came to my shop for some reason. All right? Any of you have a small business where you rely on foot traffic? It's like that. That if people are moving past your shop, you'll survive. If you are relying on them coming to your shop to get your thing, forget it. It's just not going to happen. So you need destinations is what they're called. It's a connectivity thing. It's a reason to go to a place. So our places, remember we are talking about those integrated urban villages? Those are also in proximity of schools. They are at the terminuses for these trolleys, which get you to the other ones. And they are those shopping districts, those town centers and the weekend markets. So this is how we connected up Dunedin. And um, we, we also want to look at, at technology changes. Over the next 40 years, will we have a substitution of vehicles with a high enough efficiency that that 50% can happen? There could be a big change to where people are using scooters um, instead of cars. Um, it, it won't get us there, though. We can't really get a 50% change. How about behavior change? If people adopted all those changes they told us, we saw it would be quite a bit of the fuel use would be reduced. So possible. We'll call it a low-carbon lifestyle. And what about alternatives? What if we just have biofuels and electric cars? Can we then just carry on with things? So we did calculations and a lot of research into um, the availability of biofuels. And again, we're talking 40 years. So over the next 40 years, are you going to have cars that can run on electricity that you can substitute in? And what we do then is a um, calculation thingy where we take the adaptive potentials at each given time, roll them forward, do an iterative yada yada, never mind. And we give you. <laughs> An output that has the cost factor in it, it has the probability that that will happen in it, it has how much of that 50% target do we meet, and it has whether, you know, you take all those things together and you get the answer you were looking for. Now, there is, I will say, and I'm just going to say this over and over, there is no answer, there is no solution, there's only a lot of difficult choices, okay? So what we've done is to not tell you this is your answer. Build those villages. No, it's more like, okay, let's see. If we leave, if we don't do anything, if we have the current urban form that we're used to, what are the chances that we can get to that 50% reduction fruitfully? Well, if you rely on biofuels and electric vehicles, the chances are nil. It will not happen. You will have to lose activities. Something won't be working anymore. That's what red means and what no means. <laughs> Do you know what no means? It means no. <laughs> I know you love your electric car idea, okay? But it's just like, no. <laughs> With the proviso, if what you mean by electric car is a golf cart, and if you build those little urban villages, and if you could bike anyway, then that electric cart would probably be quite useful for people with like a broken hip, or bringing a baby home from the hospital, that would be useful. Moving some cargo. If what you mean is electric cars, so what I know now would just continue, and it's just, okay, technology just substitutes, and it's all good. No. Sorry, no. Okay? Just, it's a whole other talk. <laughs> all right. Biofuels? No. Sorry. No. It's not there. It's not there in any way that is relevant to this problem. All right? Maybe 4%, but probably mostly diesel. It's just, it's just not there. It, it's something that the mind wants to happen. The mind wants to have substitutions. The mind wants to have answers. I'm sorry. It's not like that. All right. So we knock those ones off. <laughs> and then we say, okay, what about these combinations of urban form changes and efficiency improvements? And that's not too bad. If we, have, if we have choices about the vehicles that we use that is much more efficient, and, and um, we're talking much more efficient, which means you have a vehicle, but you don't use it very much, and you have a scooter that you use when, when you're going to use a vehicle. So it's like, you see what I mean? To get three liters per 100 kilometers, you have a scooter 
and you have a vehicle, but you can see the proportion of which you use um, how much. And that is possible, especially if you adapt your urban form so that your longer trips you can take other ways. Um, the low carbon lifestyle definitely is the key. That, that if that, but remember, we're talking about a city where that choice is possible. If the choice is not possible, forget it. Which, if we look at the current urban form, it's not as easy, it's barely possible, which means the next 50 years after that, you gotta really start doing something else. So these urban changes, the urban form changes, the bikeways, um, the integrated urban villages, the dense urban city center, if you have other reasons to do those, like that they're good ideas and they improve business, then they are going to increase your adaptive capacity and they are gonna allow people to make changes that they will be able to just adapt to that future that's coming. And that's probably where we want to go. There is a high risk of doing nothing. There's definitely a high risk of doing nothing if what you think you're doing is waiting for technology or alternative fuels to come in and sort you out. Because right? that, that su simply just doesn't work. All right, so sort of a conclusion is that what's going to happen is going to happen, and our choices are about how it happens. And what I think, um, they, they scheduled me for an um, open space for this afternoon for, for um, 4 o'clock. And I think what I'd like to talk about there is, is this how. And I just popped a couple of slides in because a couple of years ago, um, my group of students and I, we said, look, um, there's a lot of intention out there. We've been working with a lot of towns where they wanted to do, you know, peak oil, vulnerability. They wanted to work stuff out. They wanted to get better. Um, and it was even before Transition Town started. And, and we just thought there's, there's a lot of potential out there. There's a lot of energy. And those people with that energy, if, if we could work with them, if, if you could actually use that energy, not just burn it out, <laughs> if you could use it and change things, have it be the spur, then, then that would be cool. So we sat down, we did a lot of thinking, a lot of brainstorming, a lot of research, international research, about how people do development projects, especially when they have like brownfields um, in Europe, problems like that. And we found and put together, you know, the wisdom from around the world of how you might do that and what it would look like. And that process we called Transitionscape, and we trialed it in Dunedin in 2008, 2007. Um, we had a weekend workshop, and the point there is to actually come out with engineer with projects that need doing, positive projects that can be done with the people who can do them, and the processes that they need to get started doing it. And that process looks like number one, recognition um, of the situation, so really understanding it, and socialization of the people who who want to make a difference about it. Then the awareness of how things are different, you know, what, what the change means. Awareness of that, uh, which you can see we've been moving through with the Dunedin study. Um, then creativity, facilitation of creativity and um, of adaptation responses and challenges to the new environment. So facing that change with creativity. I don't know if you've noticed, we haven't developed um, adaptations in our physical sense. You know, we don't have fangs, we don't have stripes, we don't have um, claws, we don't have a whole lot of useful things physically that other animals have. <laughs> our key to adaptation, our strategy for adaptation is actually our creativity. It's our ability to think about things that aren't yet. And if they don't lock you up for that, <laughs> then you get called inventive. <laughs> right, so that's our key, that's how we adapt. So we have finding ways to actually unleash that and unlock it, the creativity. Then increase connectivity and organizational structures appropriate to these challenges. So finding the resources you need to do what you have found is probably a good thing to do. And then learning, 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 learning. Everybody has to learn all the time. That's the thing I think is so missing and that we found in the, in, in our research was so important that if everybody's always learning, then it keeps working. If you think you already know the answer, you're done and you're of no use to anybody. <laughs> but if you are always learning, then the creativity can keep flowing and you can keep moving, you can keep adapting with everything that comes up. 
And uh, this is just, again, some more of that transition scape stuff. The, um, how, you, how you assess the projects and, and, um, and how they're going to work. And that's, um, that's, mm -hmm. It's actually published and stuff like that, which I know is like the zero most useful thing ever that people like me do, <laughs> publish stuff. <laughs> but actually, if you go to the University of Canterbury website, and you can find me, there are links to my published papers that you can get. Most published papers, if you know what I mean, like journal papers, the stuff that I'm supposed to produce, you can't get to unless you want to pay for them. But I can put online a version of that paper pre-publication, so a Word document that doesn't have the, the logo and stuff of the journal. And so those versions are available from the Canterbury University for free, and they're, they're Google Scholar linked. <laughs> Let those things squeak through. So anyway, that's, um, that's what I had to say today. And um, I can explain more about that transition skate project and how it works. That was, um, has anybody here ever heard the transition declaration of independence? Yeah. Yeah, we, I, I, I wrote that for that thing. It was part of that recognition of the problem and socialization, like coming together and understanding what our purpose is, what our core purpose is. And that, that was just part of a tool for that, even though it was kind of cool. <laughs> All right, so um, we had uh, questions. Let's do that. <laughs>